So when should I start? <coughs> no, no. <coughs> okay. So let us let us start again. Can you hear me? Okay. So I will finish up where I stopped yesterday. Um, we had the transitions, the radiative transitions discussed. We had the collisional excitations and the excitations discussed. We had looked at the master equation. And now we need to apply that to modeling the chemistry. So we start by the most important chemical reactions that you have in the interstellar medium. And again, as opposed to Nick, who has focused on the very tenuous intergalactic large-scale <coughs> interstellar medium, I will be focusing mostly on the more dense and more uh, cold phases of the interstellar medium. So molecular clouds, the transition from atomic to molecular hydrogen, as I <coughs> showed you yesterday. So the gas phase chemical reactions, you can separate into essentially three groups. One are bond forming reactions, so it links atoms together to more complex configurations. Bond destroying reactions, so the opposite, you take something and you put it into several pieces. This also includes photodissociation, dissociative recombination, collisional dissociation, etc., etc. But you could also have bond rearranging processes, so you say transfer one part of one reactant to the other reactant. Let's say you exchange a hydrogen, you exchange an electron. So charge transfer reactions, neutral neutral reactions, etc., etc. So let me now go then through these categories. Here is a table, again from Xander Thielen's <coughs> book. Um, these are the typical reactions, how you would see it in a chemical or a chemistry book or astrochemistry book. The molecule AB gets hit by a photon and dissociates into A and B. Here are typical rates, so you have 10 to the minus 9, so this is quick stuff. Neutral, neutral is also very quick because it has no Coulomb barrier to be overcome. Um, and the units of these uh, coefficients then are given here. So one should also then look at the detailed balance equations and the way you write the corresponding rates. You have seen that several places now is if you have only one reactant that, let's say, decays radioactively or gets hit by a photon and turns the atomic hydrogen into the proton, then you only have one species involved. You treat, in the case of the photodissociation, the radiation field as some background field, right? It's not a chemical reactant in that sense. Um, different is if you have two reaction partners in a collision, let's say you have the electron, the proton, you bring them together, they merge, and you have the atomic hydrogen. Sometimes you may have three collision partners. I mean, a typical example in the uh, primordial gas is three-body H2 formation. You bring three of these things together, um, uh, three um, hydrogen atoms together, you build the molecule, you have one free atom that takes the momentum so that you can both solve the momentum and the energy equation. And you could, in principle, extend it to more and more. But as you see, it gets increasingly unlikely that you bring all three things together. So in reality, all of this modeling is finding the right reaction coefficients. And that is all the trick, and this is where all the physics sits. Good, let us start with the photochemistry. So this is the reaction A and B gets hit by a photon and dissolves. So the reaction coefficient uh, can be written in such a form. So there is some activation energy. So I the integration goes from the dissociation energy of the species I to basically um, yeah, the dissociation of hydrogen, right? Because then this is the most bound molecule, nothing helps. So this is the region you're interested in. If the energy is larger, then typically because you have many, many more hydrogens than anything else, the hydrogen snatches away <coughs> the photon and nothing is left. Now, some angular dependence, you say it's isotropic. This is uh, the mean number or the mean photon intensity of the interstellar radiation field at the frequency 
And there is some cross-section for the photodissociation region at this frequency, and you integrate all these together. Now, when you do these calculations, you get complex curves, and then what you do is you try to <coughs> fit these curves with simple fitting formula, right? So what you see in these tables, I will show you today, and I have in part shown you yesterday, what people do is they try to calculate or measure these rates in a few points. Let's say there is some, let's say, temperature and density. You have a measurement here of the rate. No, this is not working. Let's say here is your rate. Here you have a point and maybe the region of astrophysical interest, again, I should do that really correctly. Let's say you measure it at the laboratory at very high densities. I plot your density over this rate, and you measure it here, but in astrophysics, you need it down here. So what you say is, oh, I have two points, and I just ex extrapolate. OK. You could say, maybe I extrapolate with a bit of a different function that is more informed about the processes. Maybe my extrapolation formula should be something like that. And it is clear, the more data points you have, the more uh, informed you can make your extrapolation formula. And what you see here are typical ways you write down this extrapolation formula by being informed about the physical processes that are relevant here. So what you then see in the textbook, like again from Xander Thielen, you see this A and the B thing, and this is just the transition um, <coughs> thing that you find in another table. So you look that up, and this is your rate coefficient. Now, the neutral-neutral reactions typically have some um, reaction um, barrier, so this is due to the enthalpy difference of the reaction, so there might be a difference in the enthalpy of the products and the reactants, and this enthalpy barrier, you could say it's an energy barrier for this reaction to start. Let's say first you need to break a bond before you can rearrange an even stronger bond. So you need to invest some energy to break this bond before you can gain energy um, in this exothermal uh, reaction to make a new stronger bond. So this is typically then how the reaction looks like. This could also be negative if you need to invest energy to make this happen. Um, and these reactions typically then have a temperature dependence that often has here an um, a, a, a power law behavior with some exponent beta, and here it has an exponential behavior. Typical examples is, for instance, H2 plus O forms OH plus H, etc., etc. You don't need to <coughs> memorize all that. There are tables. You can look that up should you ever <coughs> need it in your calculations. So ion molecule reactions typically look like that. Some ion hits some neutral, and you have a new ion, maybe a new <coughs> neutral. These reactions are typically very fast, and they are driven by the ionization degree. So even a small ionization degree can drive very rich ion uh, yeah, driven or ion reated chemistry. So to give you again an example from the primordial universe, which is a bit counterintuitive, let's say you have a primordial halo. It is hit by an ionization front and it becomes fully ionized. So it is hot initially, but because you have a very high abundance of free electrons, you have a very efficient rate of H2 formation. So it forms the molecular hydrogen very quickly, and it can cool down extremely rapidly. And in the end, it is more cold on a faster rate than the same halo if it had not been hit by an ionization front and never went to this heating phase. So this is a bit counterintuitive, but this is a good example of how the amount of charged species, in this case free electrons, can drive very rapid and very rich chemistry. So this rate coefficients typically relate somehow to the geometric, geometric cross-section, so they are usually very simple. The rate is some constant, and here are numbers for these constants for typical reactions. So there are further reactions, um, radiative association reactions, 
electron recombination reaction. So these involve all three electrons, just like the rate I've discussed before. Again, these have a constant reaction rate, and these have a very simple uh, power law temperature dependence. So once you have these reactions, what you need to do is you need to pick your species. I have showed you yesterday results from a network with 32 species in 218 reactions. So you have a huge matrix that needs to be solved. So the change of the abundance of the species I <coughs> with time is then the sum over all bimolecular reactions that destroy the species. So this one is outside the sum and then it needs to be informed about the abundances of all the other species and the appropriate rate coefficients from A to J. Now, bimolecular reactions can also create these species. Here you need to form over all possible reaction partners A and J that together give I. All right? But there are then also the sum of the unimolecular reactions that can form and destroy the species. Again, formation needs to be informed about all the other species and the reaction rates. And if you destroy them, you just need to sum up over <coughs> the reaction rates. So typical, again, photodissociation, photoionization, cosmic ray ionization, etc., etc. So like in many, 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 many fields of physics, you have a master equation that describes the statistical whereabouts of the system. So this is a simple network that focuses on the unimolecular and bimolecular reactions. You can also increase that. But this is now... Um, first start. Now, in equilibrium, of course, you could say the change of these um, abundances of this particular species should be zero. So you have here a set of equations that give rise to the rate, plus in addition you have this constraint equation. And typically, if you want to implement it on a computer, you end up with a matrix, no, with a vector that contains the abundances, and the reaction network is then simply a big matrix that puts the abundances on one side, you throw it in the matrix, and you get the new abundances out. Just like Volker has explained just an hour or two hours ago. So once you have the reactions, they do something to your thermodynamics. So we are interested in solving such networks for two reasons essentially. We want to understand the gas dynamics, so we need to know which internal degrees of freedom are excited. How can we cool the gas? How can we heat the gas if we, let's say, compress it? And these are the cooling processes we have discussed yesterday and some of the heating processes we also have discussed. And this is from work by Simon Glover who has compiled a very extensive network that is geared to modeling um, in a time-dependent fashion, the interstellar medium. Now, if you were to go to post-processing, you can extend these networks to thousands and thousands and thousands of reactions and hundreds of species. Now, it takes a long time to solve it, and it's not possible to do that at every time step in every single cell of your computational domain. So, typically, when you do these astrochemical calculations, you need to reduce your network to make it time-dependent and run it alongside your hydro or magnetohydrodynamics, or you can invest a much more richer chemistry if you do it in a post-processing step. Let's say if you want to make detailed predictions of lines coming from a protostellar core, for instance. So, again, so again these are typical great coefficients as they pop out, out in our computer programs. You see, they, they, can, they can be considerably complicated. complicated. Logarithms, logarithms, tens, logarithms, logarithms, temperature, temperature squared, squared, logarithms, logarithms, temperature, temperature, temperature etc., etc., etc. And there are here the huge tables that in whole, whole community and calculate these expressions. So, so, now, now this, this is what you need to compile. So you need to punch in, basically, these reaction networks and hope you don't make a typo. Um, there are smarter ways to read in automated tables as matrix coefficients. So how do you solve for that? That is um, a few slides that I have taken from Simon Glover in Heidelberg, who's really a specialist on that. This is now the equation that 
in essence, Volker has discussed before. So you have the species, it is due to chemical reactions that create and destroy these species. They depend on the temperature, the density, and the densities of all the other <coughs> compounds in your system. But in addition, there are um, the advection terms. So this is the regular advection term, and there is a diffusion term, which tells you that, let's say, you put a drop of dice in water, you see it diffuses slowly away, or it gets turbulently mixed, because water is highly turbulent. Um, you can estimate what the typical diffusion length scale is, and if you resort to just molecular diffusion, you see it's very small. <coughs> you can plug in typical numbers for the interstellar medium. So if you solve this equation, it is typically fair to get rid of this thing. Now, if you do large-scale galaxy and you're interested in chemical yields and chemical gradients, then maybe this is something you need to take into account and you need to devise a subgrid scale model that accounts for this subgrid scale diffusion. But that is a different issue. So you do this operator splitting. You basically first solve the hydrodynamic um, approach, and then you solve the chemical approach. Or you do more complex splittings. So the simple strategy is you first involve the advection from one time step to the next one. You use the output of the advection step to evolve the reaction network from here to here. Typically, the reactions are faster, so this involves some subcycling. Um, you could invert the order and do it in the other direction. Now, this is the first order splitting, and it introduces, as Volker's discussed, an order that is uh, linear, uh, an, an error that is of linear order. The strength splitting is more involved. You first do a half time step, then you solve your reaction network, and then you do the other half time step. Why this works, we have just learned. Um, in addition, the network is typically stiff. So if you look at the rate coefficients, they can differ by many orders of magnitude. So you have a few reactions that are very fast, a few that take forever. And that you need to take account of. In an explicit scheme, you would, need to, you would be forced to make extremely small time steps. So <coughs> typically what the astrochemists do when they connected to the hydrodynamics, they solve the hydrodynamic step with an explicit scheme, but then they do the subcycling with an implicit scheme. So, um, good. So I mentioned that there are then these reaction equations that come out of the master equation, basically, that are the master equation. Plus, um, so these are for the n plus, for the n elements, but we have one more constraint, namely that the partial abundances of the, or the partial number densities or densities must add up to the total number density of density. So if we have one more equation, so we are in some sense over constrained. And it turns out that one must take care of that issue. Because when you advect the species, typically you make errors. And if after your advection step and after your chemistry step, you end up the new abundances, you see that the total number density and what you get from adding up all the abundances of the subspecies <coughs> does not match. Now, this is a problem because this not matching will run away and eventually destroys your solution. So it was then uh, Thomas Plewa and Ewald Müller, who said, well, if I have reactive flows, we need to take care of that. And in the most simple way, we do a trick. We add up all the fluxes from the end. And if we realize that the fluxes are not identical, we simply introduce a scaling function that forces our fluxes that advect the abundances to be um, mass conserving again. So you need to do this little renormalization <coughs> step, and then you're fine, and your calculation works very well. So typically, the <coughs> equations are stiff, so you have a problem. And let's say if you have that, you need a few very small time steps, and you need to do something better. <coughs> 
so where am I? So we use an implicit technique and in the most simple approximation in the implicit technique, I can also go very quickly over that because Folke has discussed this in great detail. Um, you simply take the solution, put it in, and you need to iterate that. Here you have information about the end time step. Now this is simple, it is fast, and they remain constrained. Oh, that is something wrong here. However, we have no proper error control and it is not the most accurate scheme. So no one does that. So what people do is they look at libraries and they pick up the library that is most appropriate for their uh, system. So this is just a list of things that people do. So what we do in Heidelberg, we take um, DVODE, so it is a sparse matrix solver that is on the market for many, many times. So maybe one more hint on how the matrix looks like. So if we have n species, then we need to invert in order to get the solution basically an n times n matrix. As you know, if you do it with the standard uh, procedures, then this scales as the number of species to the third power. It gets very quickly unmanageable. But if you look at the reaction networks, it turns out that not everything reacts with anything else. So only you have one or two, maybe three reaction partners. So this enormous matrix that describes your reaction matrix, uh, that describes your reaction system, is very sparsely populated. So out of the many matrix solvers, you pick those that are suited for uh, sparse matrices, and you can get considerable speed up. So I skip over that as well. Um, so again, you should keep in mind advection you need to take care of. Typically, you need to do subcycling, and it quickly becomes a computational bottleneck. So the example of the um, calculations I showed you before, typically 80 <coughs> to 90 percent of the time is spent in the chemical network. So if you could put that on a GPU and accelerate it by doing so, that would be a big gain. And that is, I guess, one of the strategies that people are currently um, <laughs> following to speed these things up. So there are a number of techniques to speed that up. Um, you notice that some of the reactions are fast and reach steady state very quickly. You can treat them in equilibrium. So you can take them under certain conditions out of the network. But that requires you to solve a different network for different densities. And to make this transition is not trivial. So that is also working progress and different groups try to approach that problem with different, yeah, with different schemes. I also give you a few um, useful references you can look up in the PDF later on. Good. So far, finishing up the chemistry, are there immediate questions to that part? Yes. I'm just wondering when you're solving the Actually, you are solving a big matrix, and uh, it's thick, and uh, it's sparse. Yes. Yes. So you just use a sparse matrix. Yes, solver. exactly. Then you get out the, the eigen, eigenvalue yes. of the matrix. Yes. So the question is, how well, do the integration, and then how you decide the time step to do that integration? How do you do that? So we use this implicit scheme where the time step is adjusted such that we find a solution <coughs> that is consistent with itself. So it iterates into a stable solution. Now, the question is more if you change the chemical state and maybe the thermodynamic state of your system quickly, is your hydrodynamics informed about the sudden change? So typically, the time steps of the chemistry, at least at these densities and temperatures, are faster than the time scales of the hydrodynamics. So sometimes you're forced by chemical issues or by abundance and heating and cooling issues to have very small hydrodynamic time steps as well. So you need to link the two together. And it depends on the problem how you do that. 
Good. Then I come finally, one hour delayed, to what happens on smaller scales. So we discussed the dynamics of the interstellar medium. I have shown you numerical simulations, numerical techniques that are used to approach the hydrodynamics, the magnetohydrodynamics, the turbulent properties, the chemistry of this medium. But why do we do that? In particular, we are interested in how stars form out of this highly dynamic and <coughs> complex environment. So now I want to zoom into the smaller and smaller scales and try to argue and try to see how we can connect <coughs> the dynamical properties of the ISM to the properties of stars and star clusters that form out of this environment. And because I realized I have overspent my time on the ISM and I have only yeah, less than two hours left for star formation, I will focus on one question and try to cover certain aspects of that on the way. So I would like to address a key question in star formation theory, how do we get the distribution of stellar masses? So how are the stellar masses distributed? So this is from a review now 11 years old by Pavel Krupa, and he looks at the mass function, so logarithm of the mass, logarith so it's a PDF, a logarithmic PDF of the masses um, for different star clusters. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that if you look at the Orion Nebula cluster I've shown you before, or NGC 3603, or 30 Doradus, 100 O stars, 10-ish O <coughs> stars, 1 O star, the mass spectrum looks extremely similar. That's amazing because the environmental conditions vary differently. Now, you can fit that by a multiple power law. This is the Salpeter slope of uh, minus 2.3 in this log log plot. Then at half a solar mass, it becomes flatter and it turns over in this log log plot at very small masses. So this is the way Pavel Krupa models it. If you prefer something that is a bit smoother, then you can ask uh, Gilles Chabré. He uses here again the Salpeter slope and then he puts a log normal on this side. There are slight deviations on the very low mass end, but if you look at the error bars, you know, it's essentially the same. You can pick whatever is more easy for you to integrate. Now, when you look at the observations, it is by no means clear that the IMF is universal, right? That is not at all obvious. You see huge variations. However, you can explain away these variations by dynamical effects. You could <coughs> say, if I look at clusters that have aged a certain way, I have lost the high mass stars, I have maybe <coughs> kicked out too many or a high fraction of low mass stars. So you need to correct for, that, for such a process. And if you do that, you end up with this multiple power law description as being quite good. Again, there is some uncertainty, but altogether this is not bad. So I've shown you that before. And this is, again, an example. This is Sigma Orionis. This is Alpha Perseus. These are the Pleiades. This is W35, 180 million, 120, 85 million years. And you see they differ. However, if you correct for these things, they seem to follow this universal thing, distribution. Typically, when you look at nearby star clusters, you cannot resolve the binaries. So what you get is a system IMF. And to get from the system IMF to the stellar IMF, you need to go to another step of well, disentangling these processes. So you need to make assumptions about the mass ratios in binary stars, about the binary fraction, and then you arrive at the single star IMF. And these corrections can be severe. So many, many layers of assumptions and computation go into these IMF determinations. Often we take them <coughs> for granted, but we should <coughs> be aware of that many, many <coughs> steps are involved to get these numbers out. And some, many, have certain uncertainties. Now, I argued that the IMF is universal. However, it turns out if you look at populations, either from spectroscopic uh, 
considerations. <coughs> that is uh, Peter van Dockum or uh, Charles Conroy, or from um, extended genes analysis. So population modeling of the central part of external galaxies. Uh, this is Capillary's work from the Atlas 3D survey. There are indications that the IMF changes, right? And that for larger and larger ellipticals in the central part, it becomes bottom heavy. Very strange. And the question is, how do we get that? And probably the, que the answer to that involves very complex physics, looking at, in the galactic center, different ratios of cosmic ray fluxes and UV radiation fields, different level of turbulence, different heating processes that all boil down to that the genes mass, the thermal genes mass, very basic thing that we discussed on the very first day, may change under different environmental conditions. And this is a very recent development that stuns many of the IMF modelers and their approaches how to solve it. And they all involve the genes mass argument. Good. <coughs> so after the six lectures and the many lectures by Volker and by Nick we had before, we can identify something like four key processes that determine the stellar mass function. So one are the turbulent initial conditions, so the mass spectrum of pre-stellar cores that in part turn some of their mass <coughs> into stars. Because these guys form in clusters, they may interact while accreting. The thermodynamic properties of the gas first determine the mass spectrum, of course, or influence it, and then select certain fraction of it to go into collapse and form actually stars. So thermodynamics is extremely important. And this, as we have just discussed in extensive um, detail, depends on the chemical conditions, on the balance between heating and cooling. And clearly feedback terminates star formation, may drive or trigger star formation in other places. And I think the most neglected part or the worst or the um, part that is the least understood is the feedback. So I try to go step by step through these four processes. Let me start with the turbulent initial conditions. Let me show you again this movie of the uh, Perseus cloud. You've seen it now three times. Again, it <coughs> is a hint of the complexity of the dynamics in the interstellar medium. This is what we can do on the computer. We can try to model that on a computer, but this model by Wolfram Schmidt does not have self-gravity. So if you have self-gravity, it looks like something like that. This is now completely outdated. This is only 200,000 SPH particles. Um, one would by now laugh about that. But you see the point. We first drive turbulence until we have a crossing time of four. Then I switch on self-gravity, and suddenly the high-density regions start to go into collapse. <coughs> so the basic process is always the same. Now, this simple model needs to be refined. We can refine it with modern technology. This is extremely high-resolution flash simulations with driven self-gravitating turbulence. Compressive driving, you see a cluster of objects forms on very quick time scales. <coughs> and this is solenoidal driving, and you see you have a more extended distributed star formation, and the overall star formation rate is much smaller. This has to do with the width of the PDF. You simply have less gas, a few fraction of the gas in the high density regime that is uh, about to collapse or is able to collapse. So it takes much more longer to get the same star formation efficiency. Now we have 20% and we stop. Mm -hmm. Also morphology-wise, it looks very different. Now you can increase the level of complexity. You can add magnetic fields. This shows you the field lines. This is now a mixed forcing scheme that does not do any Helmholtz decomposition of the forcing field. And you see the magnetic field slows down the evolution. You see here you can have very complex morphologies of the, of the, of the, of the magnetic field uh, directions. They can be highly tangled. And the zinc particles carry a high degree of magnetic field. And the magnetic field alignment can wiggle around quite a lot. <coughs> 
there seems to be, interestingly enough, very little correlation of the disk alignment and the overall magnetic field in molecular clouds. There is a measurement in Taurus by, uh, um, by who? François Menard and uh, collaborators. So this is something we could predict or at least try to predict in a model like that. Good. What have I done here? I have shown you calculations <coughs> where I have taken a box I have driven turbulence as we have done before and then I have turned on self-gravity and some of the regions we have seen before then turned into collapse. Let me invert the order here. Oh, this should not be here. Here we are. So if you look from the side, if you have collapse, this is now some spatial scale. Let's go here. Some spatial scale, and here's the logarithm of the density. And you see when you go in collapse, swoop, you have this exponential uh, runaway of the density on very small scales. We know we need to fulfill the Coran time step criterion, which tells us I need to have time steps that are smaller, often considerably smaller than the information crossing time, the sound crossing time through this small scale, through my smallest cell or through my smallest SPH particle or a repo cell or whatever you do. So that means once you have collapse, your code grinds to halt because the time step gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So what do you do if you want to build a star cluster and you want to get stuck in the first collapse? You need to do something. You put in essentially a black hole, you invent zinc particles. And you say, I introduce some threshold density, I cut away all the gas that is above here, here and here, and I um, put in a particle that sits outside the hydrodynamics, outside my magnetohydrodynamic scheme, it has the ability to accrete gas and it will be advanced in time by being informed about the gas dynamics, by being informed about its own dynamics, but it is something that lives in principle outside the gas dynamics. It is a subgrid scale model for collapse. This is what the zinc particle techniques is. It's basically a black hole, a black box that you put in where collapse occurs. You wave your hand and say, oh, everything will be fine, uh, which is often the case, often not. And then you can go and look at the formation of the second, third, fourth, etc. zinc particle. And depending on what environment you're looking at, you can identify then the zinc particle, if they're small enough, as protostars. Then you can look at the properties and then you can address questions like IMF, if you're brave, like spin, <coughs> easier, binarity, etc., etc. So what you do is you cut out these high density regions and you replace it by something else. And some somehow my computer also has replaced the slide by something else. Anyway, so if this is the overall idea, you have some density distribution, you say, I cannot tolerate time steps that are smaller than a certain uh, threshold. This corresponds to a density threshold. So this is the gas that perturbs me and slows down my calculation. I cut it away and I replace it by this zinc particle. And there are several ways of achieving that. The most popular one is you have a particle that has a certain radius and it swallows all the gas within this radius. Now, before you form such a zinc particle, you need, of course, to do some tests. First of all, you need to look at all the cells here, whether they all exceed this density threshold or all the SPH particles, or whatever you do. So you could say, are they all on the highest level of refinement? Then is there a conversion flow? It could be that I'm in a shear flow, right? I have, by a certain, I don't know, travesty of nature, I have a strong conversion shock, shock that is immediately sheared apart. And the thing will not be bound. It's just some of these intermittent turbulent fluctuations. Of course, I do not want this thing to go into a zinc particle because reality would not make this collapse. 
So I need to check whether the flow is convergent that creates this density thing in the first place. I should also check, and that is important, whether I sit at the gravitational potential minimum. And you see that is tricky, because if your particle Let's say this is now an overall density slope, and I put a small fluctuation here. Now, when do you think this fluctuation would start to collapse in its own right, or under what conditions would it be sheared apart and follow into the global potential minimum? What criterion would you use here? Proposals? Yeah, that it must be genes unstable, that is one aspect. But you could look at the time scales. You could look at the time scales. So there are two forces. There's the self-gravity of this thing acting, mm -hmm. and there is tidal forces acting on this thing. And you can ask, is maybe the time scale for the tidal shearing apart smaller than the collapse time scale? Then this thing should be shown apart and will not collapse. Vice versa, if it collapses faster, then it is sheared apart because the density contrast is larger, then you should make a sink particle. So just looking at the local potential minimum is not enough. You need to be informed about a wider environment. And this tells you this makes it non-local and makes it very difficult. So this is one of the tricks or the issues that you have to take care of when you form sink particles. Of course, it needs to be genes unstable. It is better bound. Um, and you don't want to, and I come to that, you don't want to have a situation like that where you have already formed a zinc particle with an accretion radius. And do you form a new one here, which would then have an overlapping radius? Maybe not. Maybe you want a minimum distance between two zinc particles to form. Otherwise, if you have a filament, you form zinc particles like a pearl on a string. You see calculations where this happens. Are they physically meaningful? I would have some doubt about that. So many issues involved. And this is why, indeed, quite a number of people are skeptical about zinc particles. I've been using them for 15 years, and I think they are very useful. But they can be dangerous, and you need to understand what you're doing. So once you have decided you make a zinc particle, then what you do is you try to follow some conservation laws. The zinc particle certainly needs to have some mass, <laughs> and it gets mass, let's say, of the SPH particle it swallows, or excess mass it takes away out of your, say, flesh cells. You need to know where the center of mass of the zinc particle is because it can move around freely. You could have binary zinc particles. Then you need to follow the orbits, and again, typically, you go into a subcycling step. You want to register the momentum to know in which direction they move. And of course, they have some spin. If you accrete gas, you change the angular momentum budget of your code. So this angular momentum must go somewhere. It must go into the spin of your sink particle. So sink particle must spin. Otherwise, you break the conservation laws in your scheme. And that is often neglected. Good. Now, how to make that, actually? What are the different approaches people do? Um, in the particle-based appra particle approaches, let's say standard SPH, a repo, basically you remove particles and put all <coughs> the information into your sink particle, which then has a certain radius. In the Eulerian codes, you, codes, you remove access gas above a certain threshold. So these are basically two brands of one strategy saying, I have one sink particle and it can accrete. So for flesh, what we have implemented, for instance, let's say the zinc particle has now, what is this, 10 cells across. We ask, let's say if our density should look like that, here is my zinc particle threshold density. I say, this is my zinc particle size, and you better make it of the size of the genes scale at the threshold density. So you have here your cells. And in each cell, you take out the excess mass. So this mass goes away. 
this mask goes away, this mask goes away, that stuff, that stuff. So this mask gets added onto the sink. So that your new gas distribution looks like that. So you still have some gas left in your cells, and that is good because you have pressure gradients here, right? You have density gradients that convert into pressure gradients. And you better do not punch a hole in this distribution <coughs> so that you have at least some smooth um, way of getting proper pressure gradients across the sink particle boundary. If you have free fall collapse, it does not matter a thing, right? Because you have supersonic infall speeds, pressure plays no role. However, if you place that in a disk and the accretion is slower than free fall, let's say you have a protostellar disk, a central star, you have a spiral density wave that has a knot here and it forms a sink particle, it will accrete on a much smaller rate. And the pressure boundaries matter a lot how far, how quickly, how much you can accrete. Another caveat. Good. Now, what is the resolution? Ideally, you want to make the sink particle minute because you want to resolve much of the hydrodynamics. However, it turns out you must have at least four cells across because, you know, if you don't do that, all you don't resolve collapse properly. But is this enough? This goes back to true love. It was Fabian Heitsch who argued, well, but you want maybe like eight cells, six cells to make alphane waves at least right to within 15%. And alphane waves are important in MHD turbulence. <coughs> now, for turbulence, it can be shown you want 32 cells across. We know that rotational motion eddies, you need 32 cells across, otherwise you completely screw them up. And to give an example, when you do dynamo theory, you look at the dynamo amplification of the magnetic field due to turbulent motions, you don't see no dynamo amplification at all if you are below 32 cells. Then the diffusion of the numerical scheme eats away all the amplification. <coughs> Only here you see some amplification. If you go to 64 cells, 128, you get larger and larger rates. These rates are not converging. If you double the resolution, you fourfold the amplification rate. It's a function of the Reynolds number and you will never reach such a, you will never converge in this aspect. So this is an aspect where you always have to rely on subcrit scale model and you need to be aware of that. <coughs> that numerics will never get the true rates because it will never model or describe the true Reynolds numbers of flows. Recall again, we are modeling honey or crude oil, not the turbulent ISM. Now, in SPH, what you do is you remove particles. So, let's come back to this thing. Maybe I can oh no, I remove it and draw it again. Can you actually see it in the back, or is it too... <coughs> So here is our sink particle threshold. So here is our sink particle. We take out these particles. So what happens now is that our gas distribution has a hole. And if you are SPH particle here, well, if I look from top here is say my sink particle accretion radius, then all the neighbors come from the left-hand side and it finds hardly any neighbor on the right-hand side. Either you make it larger that you reach out across the sink particle or you are completely screwed. Okay? So that is certainly something to keep in mind. There are techniques who say, well, maybe I keep a few particles. I, once they are beyond the accretion boundary, do not accrete them completely, but um, maybe I just take away 10% of the mass in the first time step, 20%, no, the next 10% in the next time step, another 10%, etc., etc. et cetera. So that when you accrete the mass of the sink particle, time, and this is the mass of the sink particle as a function of time, 
it's not like that. It creates a particle, it creates another particle, it creates two particles, it creates no particle at all. If you want to make calculate accretion luminosity, you are not happy about these spikes. What you want something, and that is closer to reality, is something that, you know, looks smooth. And if you, like most SPH accretion schemes do, take the entire particle mass once it has gone beyond the sink particle radius as being accreted, then you get the step function. If you give each accretion event, let's say, a decay time, either linear prescription or an exponential description or whatever you pick, then this is much smoother and it also helps you with the pressure issue. So more modern implementation in SPH, the one by David Hubber, for instance, in the Serin code, um, are doing better here. Good. So the other way, principal address or way to make sink particles to achieve mass growth by sink particle merging. So the idea is, and this is what the Orion code does, as I understand it. If you have now a region that exceeds the density threshold, it spawns gazillions of small sink particles like that, right? That is the sink particle spawning step. Then it asks itself, do I find connected regions of sink particles? If yes, then I merge these sink particles together. So I put all this stuff into one particle, and then I need to figure out, well, you know, where do I place it? Do I place it here, do I place it here, or down here? Should that be a proper sink particle? Is this what the accretion, the sphere of accretion of a protostar is? Um, I think that are questions that this um, approach needs to address. Good, <coughs> so I kind of addressed many of these issues here. So how large do you make the sink particle? The question here is, if the sink particles, oh, this is shifted a bit, I think. Let me see whether I can fix that. <coughs> uh, it's not really solving the problem. Okay, so, if I have large sink particles, these two peaks would go into one particle. If I have smaller sink particles, then I would form one sink particle here, one sink particle here. Which one is physically right? Probably one has to look at the merging time scale of these two things and the collapse time scales. But again, these blocks of gas will have some extension they can make merge later on. Questions, questions you need to address. The separation of time, of time information. You could say, you could say I can get by, get by with small sink particles, but I do not prevent new sink particles to form within a certain, let's say, security, security range. That would that fix, would this, fix problem, this problem, right? Because, because um, um, this, guy this guy before me before because, because I asked, I asked first, first the biggest things, things, things to go into sink particles, 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 this would not form, form and eventually, eventually you wait for the light of the dynamics to beef this one into that to merge it together. Sink particle, particle threshold, threshold density, right? right? If I put if my I put threshold my density, density here, here, you know, I find I two sink particles. particles. If I put if it I put here, here, I find I three sink particles. particles. Which it makes sense if this is self-gravitating and eventually goes into collapse and will soon thereafter form a sink particle. So this is not such an issue, but depending on how much physics you put into your gas, it can be an issue. And typically, what you do is you put your density threshold according what you can afford in terms of resolution. But if you go to cases where the hydrodynamics changes, you may want to place your sink particle threshold above a heating range. I come to that, I guess, later today when I discuss the thermodynamics. So if this is an equation state, so cooling by fine structure and atomic cooling lines dust. And this is optically thick line. So here optically thick to continuum radiation. We know that this area here, 
gives you a preferred scale for fragmentation. So you want to, this is density here, and this is temperature, sorry. So you want to go beyond this point, and certainly you want probably put your zinc particle somewhere here, which is called the opacity limit of fragmentation. Now this is very small, we talk about Jupiter masses. Now if you form a star cluster, can you resolve Jupiter masses? Probably not. So if you put it here, you don't get the fragmentation right. If you put it here, I think you get it right. But you keep in mind, the more physics you put into your problem, the more care you must take of what you do. Good. That is closely related, high resolution versus low resolution. If you have a low resolution run, well, you wouldn't resolve this thing. You would form one thing particle, while if you have sufficient resolution, you would form two thing particles. What is right? If you have even <coughs> more resolution, would you form three thing particles? It is key to try to reach some convergence. And for isothermal calculations, this is extremely difficult to achieve. And again, you should keep that in mind. So the questions that you're facing with is how to choose the size, what criteria do you apply for zinc particle, which criteria for accretion, how do you do the subcycling? So if you have a binary zinc particle, you want to form the small binary orbit. So you typically what you do is you separate the dynamics of the zinc particle from your hydrosolver and you add a gravity solver, an n-body code to your hydrodynamic code that just takes care of the zinc particles. And then you have four pairs of forces that can act on the zinc particles. The zinc-zinc force, the zinc-gas force, then the gas force knows about the gas, so gas-gas and gas-zinc. So that makes your bookkeeping difficult. Now, the zinc particles are per definition, a subgrid scale model. If you're interested in outflows, if you're interested in radiation, accretion luminosity, you need to have an understanding what's going on inside your zinc particle. So you better put some stellar evolution model in. This gives you st stellar radii for your accretion luminosity. It gives you stellar evolution to give you the UV luminosity in massive stars, say. What about binarity? Often, if you form clusters, you cannot resolve binaries. You must have a subgrid scale model. Radiation needs to be coupled to stellar evolution, but then you need to have a source of radiation that <coughs> opens a whole slew of problems. Outflows, how do you implement outflows? Completely open issue. Even more complicated, this is easy if you think particle, you say it's one single star. But we are faced in the SIG project um, with zinc particles that encompass entire star clusters. How do you do the accretion? Let's say if your zinc particle is a hundred stars and you accrete per time step a hundredth of a solar mass, how do you distribute it over your stars? Do you give back something? How do you build the IMF <coughs> inside these things? Because you need that to do a population synthesis model that then gives you the supernova feedback, the supernova yields, the radiative feedback. How do you deal with magnetic fields? All the zinc particle implementation do one thing, they ignore them. Is that the right thing to do? Disk evolution, etc., etc. So in summary, zinc particles are incredibly cool. They're extremely useful in star cluster formation. There is basically no calculation that does not invoke zinc particles in star cluster formation. But you need to keep in mind that there are many questions involved with that. And you should not trust a paper that does not address this at least to some minimum um, <laughs> level of sophistication. This stuff can be extremely misleading. And I think it is important to keep that in mind. Now, when should I end? Now. Now. <laughs> okay. Um, then I end now. <laughs> Other questions?
So I hope I didn't depress you too much. <laughs> I take questions. Yes. Do, do we have the capability to, for example, you call many things like a hundred thing particle? Yes. So is it possible to do radiation ray tracing for hundred source, sources in the simulation? The answer is yes. The second answer is it will take a long time. So let's say what you can do, what different people do is there are different approaches. Mark Krumholz in the Orion code has radiation diffusion and he can put in <coughs> several radiation diffusion sources. We do in the hybrid characteristics ionizing radiation with a ray tracing scheme we can tolerate maybe 20, 30 sources. Then it gets very, it just scales linearly with the number of sources, say. We put, we do now a more modern approach. We take the Enzo Moore approximation, which builds a helix sphere around each cell, in essence, around each, um, no, around each protostar, um, and sends rays out in these helix spheres. Then you can do the ionizing radiation, the optically thin uh, heating radiation. <coughs> and again, you can do multiple sources, it just scales linearly. But what you should do, because you have this helix approximation, if you have a cluster of, let's say, 10 stars here, but you want to know the radiation here, this is so far away that you can say, oh, I can merge all these 10 rays from these stars that go in my direction. So you can do ray merging that makes it much more efficient. Um, this is, I would say, the current state of the art, the two ways people try to implement it. With merging, with ray merging, you can hopefully do hundreds of sources. That is at least the hope we have in the Silk project, for instance. So it's lunchtime. <laughs> Good.